Because the things that they said, and I'm going to show and share some of the things that were said in court, verbatim. Because when you hear what people said in court, it's really beyond belief. And, what, and it's beyond belief in lots of ways. But one of the particular ways it's beyond belief is that no one thought her work was pushing on. Because this is like the courtroom drama to be told courtroom drama. This is like, this is, I don't know, I can't even begin to know how, it's like the Nuremberg trials. It's that sort of thing. And it's interesting, as I've gone through this story and worked through this story, I always think of, of the Holocaust. The only thing I can find to kind of, it's, it's and every time, all the time, with everything, and I'll, I'll mention it a few times, even I'll give this quick one in case I forget to say this later, because I could talk for about four hours, and I still forget to say this, but when I met, uh, when I met Gosnell in the prison, he said, um, like he's, you know, he's as weird and as freaky and as um, disturbing as exactly as you can imagine. But he said, um, oh, you know, I've been to Auschwitz. In the middle of all, you know. And he's super weird, he's about the size of my hands, he's looking about his hands, and his feet are big, and he likes talking about his feet and all of that. But he says about Auschwitz. And he used an adjective to describe Auschwitz that I have never heard anyone ever use. Impressive. <laughs> And what really impressed him, the whole thing was impressive, but what really impressed him, the center of this, of this case said, you wouldn't allow him to mow your lawn. And they were in charge. And they were in charge when he wasn't there and he only came in the evenings. So during the day when women were there and they were being medicated, they were being medicated by these women, by these people here. And the woman beside him at the top there, that's his wife. The woman beside, that, that will through them. But this is his wife, Pearl Gosnell, and some of you, I think, probably have educated yourself about this story. Maybe some of you have read the book. Um, and I don't want to have any access to that luggage, by the way, so they're all going to go today. Um, the, book is, the book is not like the movie. And by the way, for those of you guys coming to the movie today, please come to the movie, and you can bring short people to the movie. We show nothing. There is nothing shown in the movie. It's PG-13, and it was very intentional to have it that way. The book is not PG-13. And um, as luck would have it, he had a brother-in-law who was a pharmaceutical rep who had been in Gosnell clinic. Knew that Gosnell was short handled because they were so busy. And they got Massoff a job in there. And Massoff was like a pretend doctor. He was not, he had never um, done a residency. Um, and when he took the stand at the trial, things he said is the worst thing I've ever read. And you know, again, as I say, every time I say any of this, the fact that no one reported on this is beyond me. Like at one point he said to the judge, feel that, just feel that, see that, feel that bit in the back of your neck. He said to the judge, you know, and in the transcripts of the trial it says, indicating the back of his neck. That's where we cut. I was a fireman in hell. The blood ran down the walls. That's what he said. He said that on the road, on your pain of perjury. That's what he said in the courtroom. There were so many of them. I ran with scissors. He said that in the court. And I was so scared. And I'm writing this book and it's Sunshine and it's Los Angeles and it's, you know, that was great. And I got kind of terrified. I just began so terrified, like existentially terrified, that I, um, that I knelt down and started praying at the computer. Because I didn't know what else you could do. Because it's so shocking. And I think for, all, for most of us, you know, evil is kind of theoretical. Do you know what I mean? It's at a distance. You might have read in the book or something, or it's kind of very theoretical. But when you come close to it, you really know it. And I think a lot of you in this room are here because you know that, and you recognize it in the things that you know, the things that you know now about the world, about the world we live in, about this place, about Vermont, and what goes on here in this state, that people think is okay, that people say is law, that has the imprimatur of law, and by having that imprimatur of law allows itself to have some kind of a imprimatur that it's okay, you know, that you can destroy a child at any stage in pregnancy. So it's beyond belief. And Tina Baldwin is um, also worked there. Tina, mother of Ashley Baldwin. Ashley Baldwin was 15 years old when she went to work for Gotham. At the age of 15, she became the chief anesthetist. And, by the way, according to the two ADAs in this case, they say, thank God for Ashley Baldwin, because more people could have died if it wasn't for her. She took her job quite seriously, and, was, and she made this cheat cheat, so I'll be very careful how I say that. 
a cheat sheet, and I'll show it to you, the actual cheat sheet she made for herself. So she'd look at someone and then go, a bit of pink, a bit of blue, and she'd be mixing the drugs for the anesthesia at 15. Um, and you know, some of you might be medical people here, you know, and for those of you who aren't, anesthesia is off the charts in terms of complexity. You go to college forever for it. And things, weird things like red-haired people are different. Asians are different. And of course, the Asians being different is a real problem because, as you probably know, one of the patients that went there was from Bhutan, her and my mom were. And they couldn't even wait, couldn't even wait for her darling. And, um, and she died there from over medication. Um, and she was Asian, of course, no one knew that if you wanted to take Asian, you could go in a, in a different direction with anesthesia. Um, but that was Tina Baldwin. And then there's Adrian Moulton. And Adrian Moulton, I've written about all of these people in the book. Adrian Moulton actually, I think, is extraordinary. Adrian Moulton is one of the people who took a photograph of Baby Boy A. And Baby Boy A is at the very centre of this story um, um, in every way. And Baby Boy A is probably the main reason why Basel was a decision today. Because when, Avery, when Baby Boy A was born, on July the 12th, 2008, July the 12th, same day as my father's birthday, and of God, I mean, you know, there's all this sort of stuff that happens in this story all the time. But Adrian, he was born and he was alive. And they threw him into this Tupperware container and he was moving. And he was huge. And anyone who wants to see a photograph of him, it's on the internet. It's so easy to see. You can't unsee it. And it's not shown in a movie, just so you know. But, um, but Adrian Moulton was so moved by him that she took a photograph of him. And then years later, when eventually this all came to, you know, came to life, the cops caught up on Adrian Moulton and they came for a house. And she literally kind of went in the back and came out with this old cat. And she said, there's a photograph in there that you might want to watch. You might want to look at it. Um, and they sent the phone to Quantico to get to a free diet. But when she gave the phone to them, she said, no, I'm free. And I said to her, when I interviewed her, I said to her, oh my God, I must be terrible to get arrested. And she said, I wasn't arrested. I was rescued. And I was chatting to Mary about this last night over a glass of wine. <laughs> one glass of wine more than I should have. But it was great at the time. Um, Mary was making a point, a very interesting point about that, 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 that by saying that, she, she was acknowledging that she somehow wanted, she wanted, she wanted somehow to be, to pay retribution for some kind, she wanted something, and that by getting arrested, it was some kind of a, a relief for her, actually. And I thought that was a really interesting point, I don't know if heard anyone say that before, I thought it was a very, very interesting point. She really meant it. We put together the whole day, the last day of her life, and put it together very, very, very well. Um, there's a, there's a moment in it. So these two were given the drugs. Those two. Um, and just to, to again, in case I didn't say it, like, these are not nurses. These women have no qualifications of any kind. Uh, you wouldn't, they wouldn't get a job, you know, stacking shelves in Costco. By the way, never say a bad word about Costco. Um, <laughs> but those two are the right ones. So they're, like, they're medicating her and medicating her. And at one point, this is the bit that kills me, there's the thing that she started to put up a fuss. And so they phoned Gosnell, and he said, and it's a famous quote, med her up. Med her up. And they knew what that meant. It was to fill her up with Demerol. And they did, and it, and it killed her. But, um, eventually killed her. But the thing that struck me afterwards, she started to put up a bus. And of course what struck me was, that in between her being drugged out and then waking up, she's looking around this place. This is a woman who's been in a refugee camp. Like, she knows a thing or two about, you know, bad looking environments, but she looks around this hellhole and thinks, oh God, I'm going to die here. And she struggles, and she struggles to get out. That's just terrible, it's just an awful, awful story. It's just a terrible story. Um, that's what the doctor's office looked like. I don't know if you've been to a doctor's office that looks like that. And there's loads and loads of other photographs. I, I put in one there just to give you an idea. The place, you know, so, uh, the Department of Health in Pennsylvania did not inspect the clinic for 17 years. So during the 17 years, Carmine Monger died and Samika Shaw died, a young African American mother. And you know, it's, it's just beyond belief. I mean, it's beyond belief. But this is, I mean, you know, everything about this, I feel, could be just a redo. Given the laws you have here, given the mentality, 
because Pennsylvania had loads of regulation, it loads of laws, but if the people with the power don't uh, impose those laws, don't uh, enact those laws, don't follow up on inspections, so you've got to worry always about who, who's, who's the one in charge of the laws? Who's the one in the department? Who's in the department of health? I don't put the question out. I know nothing. But I'll tell you what I do know. I do know plenty about the Department of Health in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, who allowed two of them to die in a medical facility, and they didn't go into the medical facility to work out what happened. It's way crazy, and it's way crazy in progressive Pennsylvania. I mean, you know, when you tell the story, when I tell the story, you know, it has almost a sense that there was, this was in the 19th century, that this happened you know, in some backwater, in some, you know, this, no, this is progressive Pennsylvania, and I believe I'm in progressive Vermont here. Yeah, you know, that was a bastardization of the word for progressive, you know. Um, but, uh, so those people, so can you imagine, that woman, Carmine Mother, right, she's a refugee in a sanctuary city, and she died, and no one cared. She was dead and buried, and no one cared, until a cop turned up, and our, an undercover narcotics officer who turned up, and not just did his own job, but did the job of homicide, and did the job of all the other people, and did the job of what, of what the Department of Health should have done. But Samita Shaw died and again, they didn't inspect, they didn't inspect the clinic, it's right, it's beyond belief. If they had walked into the clinic, here's what they'd seen. There were cats walking around, in the procedure rooms. Gosnell is wearing lucky gloves and he's eating breakfast cereal. In the evenings, like when he did eventually turn up. There were turtles, big massive containers of these turtles, in the front, um, in the front reception area, and there is, and they're, and they're, and they're contained in, um, what's that, what's that orange juice product, what do they call that, um, what, 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 what? one of them, yeah, with the top cut off, and then a baby put in there. So the, when, when Jim Wood eventually did the raid, and I'm going to jump around a lot here, because I want to make sure I say things, when Jim Wood created the place, Gosnell, who has the most extraordinary aspect, he kind of like, magic it all the time, and really soft voice, he said, oh, I suppose you'll want to see that baby. And he like, opens up the fridge and goes in there, and he kept the baby, he kept Carnemire Monger's baby, and it was in there in the fridge. Um, this is the cheat sheet, she says, incredibly carefully wording that, uh, that Ashley Baldwin created. So she would look at this, to help her out, to work out how to medicate people for, for, um, for the abortions. I mean, it's unbelievable. She was 15. You know, and I, one, of the, one of the strong, you know, I, I, you know, really angry moments of this is, you know, where, was, where, was, where were the news? That's right. where, where was the journalism? Right. Who's this picture very intentionally because, who's the other person in that picture? Who's the girl? You see that? And everyone in America knows her name. That's Jody Abbott. You remember the one she had the affair with the Mormon guy or whatever, and she murdered him, and we got all the lovely, salacious details of their relationship and how she killed him. And by the way, very, very tragic for him and his family that they lost their, their lovely their boy or whatever. But everyone knows her name. And what we did was that she was on trial at the very same time as Colonel Gosling. And no one, and to this day, people don't know who he is. <clears throat> but we're changing all that. We are changing all that. And here's why this case was not covered. And so I'm going to go give you, and it is, I, I, I said issues, I'm going to read this stuff out, and some of you are probably reading this. But these are a few moments from the trial. So one of the things they had to do, in order for the jury to distinguish between murder and legal abortion was to have legal abortionists come and tell how a good abortion is, what a good abortion looks like. And I think this is the most valuable thing for the whole story, is that good abortionists describe what a good abortion looks like on the record, under pain of perjury, in a court of law. No pro-lifer wrote this. This is an abortionist telling you how to do it, but it's done well. And here's the defense lawyer. From what I've seen, and you can correct me, you obviously know more about this than I do, the evacuation process can be done where tools are used and the pieces are pulled out, right? Right. 
And you might find our little bag is unfortunate with that. Right. For larger babies, well, the suction catheter is inserted in the base of the skull to remove the contents of the head because the head is the largest part of the body that sometimes gets even indication to be quiet journalists to determine the report in this case. But they might have had to put that quote into a newspaper because I think the biggest enemy of this abortion case in America is ignorance. A huge problem is ignorance. People do not know. Good people do not know. A lot of good people do not know. And I'm going to really push that point home uh, today. Here's another very sad one. Maybe I should finish my April the 10th, 2013, a woman testifies about her abortion. She's 15 um, and received no counseling. Did you have any conversation with the doctor before he did the ultrasound or put those sticks into you? Yes, I asked him, what's the sex of my baby? And he told me, if I'm good enough, I can know. But he never told me. That's what he got us. So it's like, so, and they're all coming out with these like bags of money in the evening, you know, they're all getting this cash. And messing around and having fun and joking around. Um, and it's, it's super disturbing, you know. Um, you remember that a guy called J.B. Mullane, who was a local journalist in Philadelphia, famously risked going to prison to take this photograph inside the courtroom, where he basically wanted to not, you know, to, to record that no one was filling the seats that were reserved for the journalists. And they had kept the biggest courtroom for this trial. They kept this really big courtroom because they expected such an interest. And then, you know, crickets. Um, news is what someone wants to press, everything else is advertising. The power is to set the agenda. What we print and what we don't print matter a lot. That's it. Uh, Gray in the Washington Post. I like this one better. In a time of universal receipt, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Mm -hmm. um, and people need to keep on revolting against this. Um, you know, I, and these, this could be interesting for you guys to kind of check this out. I mean, these are all, so this guy who operated this clinic for 30 years, two of them died, but not, it wasn't more than that. Women were turning up at hospitals all over Pennsylvania, extremely badly injured all the time. There were, there were lots of complaints about everything, and no one did anything. And these are the ones who failed. And I'm wondering if you just put in front of them, you know, I'm just wondering for mom, what's the situation here? Department of Health, Department of State, uh, Philadelphia Health Department, Philadelphia Department, Sanitation, Philadelphia Hospital Doctors, the School of Nursing, I have to stop on the School of Nursing. The School of Nursing, the Jefferson School of Nursing in, in Philadelphia, supplied student nurses the clinic. And when they eventually came to be spoken to at the grand jury, the assistant district attorney, Christine Wexford, she said she wanted to hit them. She wanted to slap them. If you can imagine, you know when you think of young student nurse, you know, nice, fresh faced young one, right? Basically, she would look at them and say to them, like, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you do anything? And they said, well, we just thought that's how it was in an inner city clinic. And by the way, you know, inner city, and that's racist, right? And that is racist. And it's that thing, what do I call that? The soft biggest, the soft biggest with no expectations. Oh, it's good enough for them. You know, it's good enough uh -huh. for them. So, yeah, and it's interesting, the School of Nursing, the Jefferson School of Nursing, by, by the way, which is in receipt of taxpayer money in Pennsylvania. I wrote to them and asked them set questions. They never answered any question, but I wrote to them. They didn't answer my questions, the Department of Health wouldn't answer my questions, the Department of State wouldn't answer my questions, the Department of Sanitation, none of them answered my questions. And some of them wrote and actually said, you can try to force us to answer your questions, you won't win. Wow. And they were like, kind of happy with themselves, you know? Like, happy about that, that they didn't have to answer anyone's questions. But before this thing gets way too depressing, it's really important to look on the bright side and realize that in the middle of this story, there is this amazing man called Jim Wood, um, who's a Catholic, who is a family man from, like, he himself is from a family of, like, 12, and his mother's just rock stars. And Jim is just fabulous and has a very large family himself. He's just beautiful, a great man. And, and the assistant district attorney, Christine Wexler, said Jim was remarkable. They couldn't have done this case without him. He was obsessed. He was Carnegie Mongers champion. He was the only one. And this whole case is about him. This whole thing is about him. Played brilliantly by, um, by Dean Cain, who is the young Superman, who is 
Paris and that, and he's great in And then he was joined, Jason was very quickly joined by these two other guys, um, Jason Huff, who's an FBI agent, and Steve Doherty from DEA. And they were great, and they became the three amigos, and they really saw this thing to fruition and really pushed, pushed everything to make it happen. Um, <coughs> I always say it's very important to tell a good story. I'm not making the story up, it's like a real thing, and I just think this is great. So, we all the research, and we were talking to Christine Wexler. She told us about this one particular day at the grand jury where, and it's just incredible, you know? So, and I got a lot Am I okay? I'm okay, great. Because I'm going to keep on going, not what, right? So, um, so, so, the, so all of the, you know, that grand jury, loads of witnesses come, right? So, this one witness came, this girl, and you know, what happened to you? What's your story? Oh, well, I went there for an abortion, this woman said, right? And well, what happened? So the first day, and she was, again, she was late, a late-term abortion, and the first day they put in this laminaria, these, these sticks or whatever, and she said to Gosnell, well, what happens to the babies afterwards? And he said, oh, we burn them. And the, 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 tr the thing is that she goes home that day, right, and has to come back the next day. So she goes home and she talks to her cousin, and her, and just not, she's not happy with her. And then, so this girl is standing, is giving out evidence at the grand jury, and, and, and Christine Wexler says to her, what happened then? And she says, um, you know, uh, the, the cousin phoned, the cousin phoned Gosnell, and Gosnell, you're not getting your money back, you're not getting your money back, and I don't do reversals. And Christine said to her, well, what happened? And she said, oh, oh, my baby started kindergarten today. <laughs> and the grand jury all stood up and applauded. Because <laughs> they had heard nothing good. They have been there for over a year, just regular people, listening to these awful stories, the worst stories they've ever heard, and they heard something beautiful. And they were like, yes! <laughs> you know, they were like, but it gets more incredible than that. We went to Oklahoma City to, sh to shoot this movie, and we were like, you know, and I was like, Thank you. you know, we had this two point, we raised two point three million dollars, you know, from these people, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and we didn't have an actress to play the role of that girl, the girl who changed her mind, the one that got away as we call uh, Nick Searcy, the director of the movie, uh, was in an IHOP and meets a waitress and says to her, Do you want to be in my movie? And she's like, Oh, yeah, that girl is the first guy who said that. Do you want to go back to your apartment to have a script? <laughs> and uh, he said, I, you know, I, I hear you. I'll go to my apartment and get the script to come back to you. And he came down anyway, and she ended up being the girl in the movie, and there she is, Tessie Tess, Tess, Watkins. And so she came on set, and you don't shoot movies in sequence. So the first scene of a shot, the last scene of the movie, which she's in. And then the second scene was the grand jury scene. And I was there, and I was on set, and she comes in, and I've been chatting to her a lot the first day she was on the set. And so she came to me, and she went, Oh my God, you will not believe this. This is my story. And I said, what do you mean? And she went, I was, I was having an abortion. And what I'm going to do now is, and I'm really concerned about the time, but I'm going to talk to Mary about that, I have got to show you what she said. Because I spoke to her, she told me a story, and then um, my, I told my husband, and he said, go back, go back and ask her, would she, would she do it on tape? And I have to show it to you, because no matter what, you have to see it. I'm playing Viola Brown in the Gosnell movie. Uh, my voice will be in this, just don't, don't, don't say yes or no. So, you just, you just spoke to me earlier right? why, why is this role important to you? Um, I actually symbolize with my character. I symbolize with my character. Um, I also was um, young and pregnant at once. Uh, I went in to actually abort my baby, and the nurse had let me hear my son's heartbeat. Uh, it's also something they're not supposed to do. But um, she let me hear the heartbeat of my baby, told me that my heart, baby's heartbeat is that she'd be back to go ahead and do the procedure. So as I lay there for about maybe four or five minutes, she um, came in and said she'd be right in. And I lay there and I just started crying and decided it was something I couldn't do. I couldn't kill my babies. So I put my clothes on. I went out to my grandpa, told him I couldn't do it. Let's go. And I just feel I very much symbolize with my character in this, and my baby is now six years old. She also went through the same thing. She decided not to go through the abortion, and she had her baby, and her baby is five years old. What would you say to her? 
um, if you have that opportunity and you decide not to go along with the abortion, don't do it. My son has been so much joy to me. It's like when I look at him, I I just can't believe that I was going to kill somebody so precious that it's a whole generation of me. And I'm so thankful to that nurse for giving me the opportunity to change my mind and have my baby. And it's been such a joy. Just there's days that I just lay in bed and watch him sleep. I'm so happy to have him. So if you have that opportunity, don't kill your baby. Have your baby. It's hard, but have your baby. It'll mean everything to you. Don't kill your baby. Have your baby.
an email, your email, whatever. I, I send it all. We're doing all kinds of things. I pull the people in the ask the people, please send us money, please send money today. And the next thing, I get an email back from the first nursing. And he said, and he's like, you know, he was like, who are you? And I said, well, the last thing we did was Frack Nation, and he just wrote back, all caps, we love you. Oh, <laughs> I got 15 minutes on the ring, on the on the Rush Limbaugh show, and the money just poured in like it was a race. Yep. 
They won't write about you because they want you, they want everyone to ignore you, to not know that you're there. So the best thing that you can do is make sure you get copies of the film. You really need to buy copies of the film. And 